problem with critical race theory is that it demonizes white people. Does it claim that white people have like pointy tails? Not literally, but it says all white people are bad. No, critical race theory does not say all white people are bad. Well, it talks about white privilege. We live in a country that was built by people who were enslaved because their skin's a little darker than yours and mine. So yeah, we have some privileges. Yeah, but slavery was abolished. Still have slave catchers. Slave catchers? Yes, slave catchers, but now we call them police. Well, I don't feel privileged. When you post on TikTok, does anybody ever say you should still be enslaved? No, black people hear that and worse literally every day. Yeah, but how is that white privilege? I prefer to think of it as white armor. Armor? When black people express their opinions online, they're often attacked in degrading racial terms. That doesn't happen to us because our whiteness is like armor. I guess that makes sense. But why does that make me a bad person? It doesn't. But critical race theory makes me feel like I should be doing something. Well, you are wearing armor. What does that mean? Black people have to fight against racism every day of their lives without the benefit of armor. Since I have armor, I could probably help. That's the idea. I guess that also means that if you're wearing armor and not helping, kind of a dick move. Well, so why doesn't critical race theory say that? Critical race theory says that if you have privilege to use, you should use it to help people without. That's what I just said. Well, that just seems like basic stuff. Why is there so much controversy about it? That's just marketing. Marketing? Yeah, propaganda for the Republican Party. What does the Republican Party have to do with this? Critical race theory has been around for decades and suddenly, a couple months ago, all Republicans start talking about it all the time. Is that a coincidence? We did all start talking about it at the same time. Because it's a marketing campaign, except the product is racial division. But I thought critical race theory was what was dividing us. Critical race theory is a call to action for white people to help dismantle white supremacy. The only people who find that divisive are white supremacists. Believe it or not, Eraserhead is my most spiritual film. Mm-hmm. Uh, why, why, we'll elaborate on that. No. Y'all are coming in hot with these questions. I love it. I love it! Also means so much to be y'all's gay big sis and that you trust me with these questions. Like, <laughs> y'all? Getting right down to it, I get this question a lot. And I think it's in part because we are taught in most sexual education curriculums that PIV is the definition of sex. And when you have someone with a V and another person with a V and there's no PIV to be had, you're like, what do we do? And I'm sorry to break it to you, y'all, but this is sex education, not a Cosmo article. So I can't really lay out to you step by step what to do. That's for y'all to figure out. But I can reshape the definition of sex for y'all, and hopefully that'll help. PIV is not the definition of sex. It's just one way to have sex. If you get farther than kissing and rolling around with your clothes on, you're being sexual and thereby having sex. And I know that screws up everyone's ideas of bases and what base you got to, but that's all also made up. Y'all know that, right? So stop thinking about sex as one particular position, act, no. If you're giving or receiving pleasure, you're having sex. With that being said, getting comfortable with another person first requires getting comfortable with yourself. I've already got some videos on this, go check them out. Then once you find out what you like, share that with your partner. Talk about it so much. And talk about it in a setting where sex is not an expectation. What I mean is talk about it on a park bench and then days later have sex. That will take the pressure off of you to then do what your partner asked for in that moment. It'll give you time to think about it and reflect on if what your partner is asking for is something that you're really wanting to do. Plus, talking about it in a setting where sex is not going to be expected also helps build a little bit of sexy tension for when you do get to that activity, if you do. And what's wrong with that? Anyway, hope that helped. Honestly, I'm having a bit of an identity crisis. See, because I was always told that feminists hate men. That feminists treat men like they're rapists and assaulters and violent and blah, 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 blah. But you and your video and the comments in this comment section that you're liking are all about men not having control. Are all about the fact that women should have to censor the way that they dress and act so as to not provoke a reaction from men because men are so animalistic that they can't control their impulses. So which one of us is it that thinks men is less than? Because it's starting to sound like it's you and other men.
I personally think that we should hold men accountable because I think they can control their impulses. See, I'm, like, I love men. I'm a father, father, gentleman. It's held up by these little rubber gaskets, except when he tries to stand on it, they slide down. Hey there, hi, my name is Mercury, I'm the train's maintenance lady, and Mary, I have been looking at things all day, and coming up with a bunch of stupid ideas. <laughs> First of all, how dare you say that this isn't a maintenance question? Every question is a maintenance question, Mary. <laughs> okay, so here are my thoughts. First thought is maybe something like a cup link would work. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the metal that would be on it. Usually this is used for plumbing. Maybe it would be too actual thick for this. But if this doesn't work, I have another idea. See, I thought maybe a hose clamp. But my spouse was like too sharp around a child. So, a steel loop clamp that's rubber might work really well for this, and I think you can buy a bunch of different sizes. Especially because it's super cheap. I hope this helps, and have a great night! So we had multiple people ask us, what is white feminism, and why is it so harmful to women of color and feminism as a whole? White feminism is a form of feminism that focuses specifically on the struggles of white women while failing to address the distinct forms of oppression faced by ethnic minorities. So when you end up highlighting only a white woman's experience, you end up erasing the individual experiences of black women, women of color, and indigenous women. And this is so problematic because say you're looking at police brutality as a feminist issue, and you would have to agree that the way a white woman is affected by police brutality is not the same in which a black woman would be. Which is exactly why, when looking at feminism, intersectionality is so important. And I'll be doing a video on intersectionality, so like and follow for more. I've seen a lot of videos on my For You page lately talking about this quote from Margaret Atwood in The Rubber Bride. You can pause to read the whole thing, but a key line is, you are a woman with a man inside watching a woman. You are your own voyeur. And even though Atwood herself is a shady character, to say the least, I have to say that this is a really good quote. I remember reading it for the first time and having it change my entire perspective on my self-esteem and self-image. Growing up as a girl, I learned to be very hyper-aware of my appearance. Because every time I was in public, and even sometimes in private, I would have this image of myself in my mind of what I would look like from a third-person perspective. And this quote made me realize that perspective was specifically through the eyes of a man whose attention I wanted. Because not only was I looking at myself as someone else, but I was judging my appearance based on whether or not this imaginary male viewer was finding me desirable. Was my posture correct? Was my hair out of my face and falling perfectly on my shoulders? Was my expression not too standoffish? Etc. And all of these self-checks were done as a way to police myself and my appearance, to ensure that I was complying to a particular set of beauty standards and feminine archetypes. Sandra Lee Barkey also talks about this internalized male voyeur and likens it to Foucault's concept of panopticism. Panopticism is based on this version of a prison called a panopticon, in which inmate obedience is ensured through the illusion of constant surveillance. Bartke says, in contemporary patriarchal culture, a panoptical male connoisseur resides within the consciousness of most women. They stand perpetually before his gaze and under his judgment. She then connects this concept to Judith Butler's work and says that its purpose is to ensure that women are always performing femininity correctly. Because under patriarchy, women are taught to self-discipline so that we correctly play the role of women, even without men's direct instruction. We internalize the rules of what it means to move like and act like and look like a desirable woman and kind of create this psychological male surveiller to oversee that. Bartke continues, the woman who checks her makeup half a dozen times a day to see if her foundation has caked or her mascara has run, who worries that the wind or the rain may spoil her hairdo, who looks frequently to see if her stockings have bagged at the ankle, or who, feeling fat, monitors everything she eats, has become, just as surely as the inmate of the panopticon, a self-policing subject, a self-committed to a relentless self-surveillance. This self-surveillance is a form of obedience to patriarchy. So I think all of these quotes show how patriarchy not only affects society on a structural level, but on an individual psychological level as well. They 
also show how often the most relentless enforcers of gender can be ourselves, thanks to the way we've internalized what we've been taught about patriarchal gender norms. Here are the sources of the quotes that I used, as well as some further reading on Foucault and Butler. I definitely recommend checking out Barkey's work for yourself, as well as the others, because it's really eye-opening. Megan Fox looks stunning in this year's VMAs, but let's not forget what Hollywood put her through at such a young age. One of the best examples of Hollywood over-sexualizing teens. Hat and like six-inch heels. And uh, he approved it, and they said, you know, Michael, um, she's 15, so you can't sit her at the bar, and she can't have a drink in her hand. So his solution to that problem was to then have me dancing underneath the waterfall getting soaking wet. And that's... Perfectly wholesome? At 15, I was in 10th grade. So that's, wow. that's sort of a microcosm of how Bay's mind works. It, yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's really a microcosm of how all our minds work. But This... Right here, this. I have no idea why I didn't think about this. This is brilliant. Yes, not just the risk of pregnancy, but the risks in pregnancy. Yes, a thousand times, yes. No, you're right. Not all bodies are healthy. Not all bodies are capable of being healthy. That's why it's ableist to assign morality to health. 